Hi, welcome to Ghostman Radio Station, and today I'm talking to Sandra and Aaron, who are going to talk to Sandra, is going to talk about two books, a previous book, which is, I would say, a little bit taboo, but I'm a great believer if you don't talk about the taboo, you don't break the taboo. And uh, Sandra is now going to take, tell me a little bit about her first book, because obviously she's the author, and she can tell me a little bit more detail about why she wrote it, and why it was so important to write it. Okay. Thank you so much, first of all, for having Aaron and I here on the show. Thank you. We're truly grateful to be here with you. I wrote the book. I, I did military time. We're both mil uh, U.S. soldiers. He was in the Air Force. I was in the Army. And we did 50 years between us. So, And we were both raised by single mothers. So in my family, I grew up with five sisters and a brother and uh, an abusive father. My father was very abusive. And back there in the 1940s, uh, no one told anything. If, if a woman was being beat or her children being beat or battered, no one did anything about it. It's not like it is today. If somebody calls the police or turns somebody in, somebody comes to investigate. Back then, no one came to investigate. Everybody minded your business. Even if your neighbors knew, my neighbors knew that my mother was being beat halfway to death. People knew it on our block. But nobody would tell it. Nobody would ever say anything. When I was like nine or so, nine or ten, I can't really remember exactly. But my father came home and he beat my mother. And my siblings and I thought she was dead. He actually, um, I know I'm going to talk about that, but sometimes that one makes me cry. But he actually um, threw my mother. It's a long story. My mother cooked spaghetti that night. And it was way back. And it was in the summer, nice day. My dad was a truck driver, a long haul truck driver, wasn't home a lot. And that night we had spaghetti. And uh, my dad, we had to eat. And then my dad came home, and my oldest sister, Mary, I talked about in the book, told us that our dad was home. And we called him William, and we called my mom Dot. We didn't call him mom and dad. And she said, Everybody be quiet, William's home. So we all would go in the living room, sit down. We could see him getting out of the truck and, and parking outside and coming in the house. He came in the house, he didn't say anything to anybody, so we didn't say anything. We knew when we could approach him and not approach him. So he went and walked in near the dining room. It was like a shotgun house, so living room, dining room, kitchen, walk right through. And my mother said, are you hungry? Do you want something? He said, he nodded, he said, yes. So I sat down to the dining table and my mother went and fixed his plate with spaghetti. And he came back and she sat in front of him with his fork and everything. And I was just out of nowhere. My dad just stood up, emptied over the table, spaghetti went everywhere. He threw a dish into her china cabinet, which was on his left. You can picture that, a window in a china cabinet. And then he went over and emptied it over. So all my mom's little knickknacks and stuff that she saved along the way are all broken up and no good. Then she ran when he hit her. She ran past him and ran up the stairwell, which would be on the side of him. He ran up the stairwell and chased my mother. And he pushed her down the steps. She got on the steps. Then he came back down and he picked up this bicycle and back a long time ago in the fifties had the, the Columbia bikes with the thick wheels. He picked up a bike, me and my sister had a bike and he threw it on her. And then he just started kicking her and everything. Pretty soon she wasn't crying or whimpering. She was just laying there. So we thought she was dead. And I can remember picking up something. I always thought I picked up a, a lamp um, to hit him. But my sister younger than me said she thinks I picked up a shovel. She remembers that. That's how she remembers it. And I hit him when he was leaning over her. And he fell on top of her. I ran out that door as fast as I could down the steps across the street to my mom's girlfriend's house, who had a telephone. And we had a telephone, but I couldn't call at that instant. So I ran to her, and she banged her door. And she came out, and she came out. And she grabbed me, and she saw my dad in back of me, chasing me. And he told me to come here. And he said, what are you, what are you doing? She's like, no, I'm not letting her out. She's hysterical. What's going on? And I was, remember crying to her. He killed mom. He killed mom. She's dead. She killed I. And so he said, I'll bring, my mom girlfriend said, I'll bring Sandra home when she calms down. But what she did is she called my paternal grandmother to tell her what was going on. And then my grandmother called two of my uncles, my dad's brothers, who came over, took about 20 minutes and they were at our house. And she could see them when they pulled up. So then she took me home. But that was the first time in my life and my sister's life that we saw that there was somebody not afraid of my father. When my two uncles went there, they kind of chastised him, like, whoa, you know? You know, because my mom was bleeding and she's in the kitchen crying and knocked out her teeth and crazy stuff. And that was the first time we felt 
some there was somebody else who wasn't afraid of him besides us. We were always afraid of him. So from that point of view, my mother made her way away from my father with her seven children because my maternal grandmother got that news from my paternal grandmother that she said, you need to get your daughter before my son kills her. My grandmother did come to get her daughter. But that's a long story, and I talk about in the book how she escaped from him with us. So then I wanted my I wanted my children, especially my daughter, I have two daughters and two sons, and my youngest son was murdered some time ago. But I wanted my daughters and my sons not to know women don't get beat by men and men don't beat girls. And I wanted to teach my children that. So I, I wanted to write the book so they could have how I grew up, how they could understand me, how I was like I was. I was always the perfect young mother because I was a I was a teen mom and I was widowed with four kids at 18, just turning 19. So I was widowed at 19 with four kids. So I'm a, I'm a teen mom. I don't really know how to raise kids. I'm trying to figure my way out with my mom and everything and went through so many trials and tribulations trying to figure out where I'm going. But I wanted my children to understand how I live and how I came up so they wouldn't make the mistakes of tripping into a relationship especially my girls where somebody was beating on them or my boys were beating on a girl. I didn't want that. So I wanted to have my history. And then what I found out in writing that book, the gates just kind of opened up with people wanting to know more about what's going on in my life. And it was mostly my nieces and nephews because they had no idea that their grandmother went through such a horrendous life and that my their grandmother was a horrible man. They never knew that. And they couldn't believe it. I mean, one of my nephews said, oh my God, I'm so glad you didn't tell that story about granddad was alive. I tell you, I don't know how I would have been able to take him. But I said, there was a reason why that book was written when he was dead. My mother was gone too, because my mother and sister died in a house fire. It was a tragic house fire. So I talk about different things like that, that keep me motivated to move. Because sometimes I feel like I, I just want to give up. And since I married Aaron, and we've been married almost, this is our 50th year. I still at times get those flashbacks. And I feel like I want to just not be in the moment. But he makes me be in the moment because he says, that's enough. We're not going there. So that motivated me to pass on generational history because I knew I didn't have any generational money to leave my kids. So I said, let me write this book. And then I just started writing book two because I talked about more things. And they just couldn't believe everything I wanted to when I was young. They were like, wow, you never said anything. And then I think back, wow, my mom never told me she's a foster child. Some things you just don't tell. But I thought that it was time to tell, motivating other people who have those demons back there that are holding them back to tell it. It doesn't matter who you're going to hurt because that's their problem, not your problem. Because a lot of, I worry somewhat about some of my sisters, about what they might think. And two of them weren't very happy about it. And one of them wouldn't sign permission to be in my book. And it's okay. I just excluded her. It's not a problem to use her name. So people don't like to, to hear the truth sometimes. But you know, the truth, I believe, will set you free. I think the more you hold it in, the worse life you have. You can't be happy. And right now, I'm spending my time with my husband trying to live the best life we can live. It's our time. And I feel good about the books. I'm writing book three in that series, which I hope to be done writing by maybe December. I'm working on it. And then I don't know where I'm going to go from there. But right now, I'm happy, and I, I like this journey because my husband and I are doing radio and podcast interviews, and it's it's been fun. It's, and I've met I've met so many people. Yeah, you know, I've, I've as I said before, I thought it'd be nice for people to learn that the first book was so powerful and it meant so much for you an emotional journey. Because lots of women and men who go through the same yes. thing. We have to mention that men do sometimes yes. go through the same thing. Yes. And perhaps they may be inspired to think someone may be listen and go out and read your book and think. No, I don't want to live like this. I'm going to go out and do something about it. And it is the one yeah. of the hardest steps you're going to do. It. People think it's easy to walk away from this situation, and Not easy. It, it, it's. Um, and then other people say, "Oh, why do you stay in this situation?" But it's because they're afraid of the. They're afraid, and sometimes they have nowhere to go. My mother was a mother with seven children. She's a high school dropout. She didn't have a job. Where She couldn't drive. Where was she going? She was trapped. She didn't know where to go. That's a lot of baggage for a mom to do with all, all those children and the education and no motivations for money coming in. A lot of them are trapped because they have nowhere to go. They have nobody to depend on. 
sympathy from that person who's victimizing them. So now we go on about your second book, which is much more joyful, uh, and yeah. it mentions more about Aaron and how he came into your life. And yes. obviously he's a wonderful man and a gentleman compared to what you was used to before. Yes. Uh, and yes. it tells you how you've did another journey in your life, which I think is fascinating because I couldn't do it. It's in the journey of, of foster caring and stuff like that. It, 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 it's a very big job to take on someone else with kids who may it have is. very emotional and psychological problems. I'm I'm not being horrible, nasty, you know, or anything. No, it's, it's a challenge. And I think that for both of us being raised by single mothers gave us some good input and what we wanted. Like he, we do it. We did a lot of boys and he did that because what, you think boys should have a father? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I like the foster care. Well, first of all, me and Sandy, we've always had people living in our house. Our daughter was telling us the other day, she said, you know, when we were home, and they didn't, she didn't move out to around 2018, 20. She said, I've never remembered just you, me, and my brothers and sisters being in our house by ourselves. We've always, we always had someone, aunts, uncles, nieces, nieces, nieces. brothers, and their families just staying with us. Uh, one time, uh, Sandy said we were both in the military, and I was stationed in St. Louis, and they were here in Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base. And I used to fly in on Friday and fly out on Sunday. And I flew in this one Friday, and these two girls, a, a girl, teenagers. teenagers, my daughter's friends, one was a Filipino, mm -hmm. and one was an English girl. Yeah. And uh, they were in their pajamas, and I'm thinking, they're, oh, you know, I flew in Friday. I see them in their pajamas. And I'm thinking they're spending the weekend. So, uh, you know, I ain't say nothing. So I fly in the next weekend. They're still in their pajamas. And I asked my daughter, I said, hey, when are they going home? Oh, she said, Dad, I meant to tell you, they live here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. I let them move in. Because the one, both their moms left, the mom, the one from the Philippines, her mom went back. They were both military wives. She went back to the Philippines with her husband, and I went. Mom went back with her husband. Yeah. So uh, I almost went to even up, but she left Maryland. So I decided they were all friends when they were living on Andrews Air Force Base. They were all military brats. It was okay. I didn't mind them staying there. We had room. So there was always somebody there. Yeah. So I, I think that prepared. Like I say, there was someone always in the house. So when everybody left. Sandy got this empty nest syndrome, you know, <laughs> that, oh, this, we got this big house and there's nobody here found. So he I'm was happy. I'm going to let her tell you about how we got into foster care. He was quiet. He was like, he said, I'm not lonely. Find something to do. Get a hobby. I don't want a hobby. I was working. I'm a nurse. I was working. That wasn't good enough when you come home and the house is just quiet. I actually read a story about a foster child uh, agency looking for a placement for a foster child. And I went to um, to go check on her. The story read that they were looking for a home for a Caucasian girl who was pregnant to an Afro-American boy, and they were having a hard time placing her. So I called the agency up, and they invited me in to chat. And when I got there, a few other uh, mothers there, we were all listening to the same story. And come to find out, they said that child was placed. We all felt, though, that was like a bait and switch. You said something just to get us there. It wasn't really true. But anyways, we ended up getting our first child. She was Caucasian. And that was a little hard, too, because in our agency, they had never mixed races together. So she was white. We were black. And I told her, I said, my husband and I are both military. We've been around so many different people all over the world. We don't care what race she is. She's a child. She needs a home. Let us try. So they did. And we got that child. And like she uh, she was just one of our favorites, you know. And she's, of course, in her 40s now. That was a long time ago. And she researched me on social media one day. She popped in on a, a text and she said, hello, are you the Sandra that's married to Aaron who lives in Upper Marlboro, Maryland in the United States? And I said, yeah, that would be me. Who are you? And she said, this is Michelle West, mama. And she had a whole different last name on social media. I said, you have a different last name. She said, I'm married and I married a soldier. She said, I'm in Germany with the kids. She said, the next time I come stateside, I'm gonna come to see you. So. When she did come stay out a year or so later, 
And she came to Maryland to see us and brought her twins. She had a, her daughter, she had a set of twins, another daughter. And it was just lovely seeing her. So I think the joy of foster parents is when they reach out and find you and tell you what they're doing and things like that. You know? But she also said that I married a soldier and he's, like, and he's black and he's just like dad. <laughs> she thought about me. So, oh you know. God. So it's influence. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, like they said, you can take a child from any race, anywhere, and put them in any foreign country and they're going to learn that language because that's what they're going to hear. Or know that, you well, know, that's true. I think, I think there's too much emphasis on the. I mean, I know that there is a diff, uh, the, the cultural differences between being yeah, white yeah. and black. I mean, sometimes some people can't. You can't even say the word black in some places now yeah. because people get offended by the word. But you're thinking, well, it's a color. I mean, I'm not being horrible, but it, yeah. it, it, it's a bit hard not to say the word. But I, I don't have a pro- the problem, but did you ever come across any kind of racial tension during your time, or was you okay? Was it that? Yeah, sure. I can answer that. Uh, we had one child. Uh, his name was Richard. And uh, I, I love this kid. He's Caucasian. He was Caucasian. And one time, I'm going to let you tell the story about the restaurant. We took him to a restaurant. So we went out to dinner. We had another child with an Afro-American child. We all went out to dinner at um, Olive Garden. So I told the boys, just get your menu and get what you want. You get whatever you want. So we're looking at our menus, deciding what we want. I'm like, hey. I tapped the table and he looked out some smaller. You want to go somewhere else? Because we can go to another restaurant. And he said, no, it's just that. I said, it's just that what? He said, I never knew that black people did the same thing that white people do. I said, what do you mean? I mean, the family went out to eat and everything like that. I'm like, of course we do. We all do the same thing. He had no idea. He said, my dad told me different things. And that's when we found out that his dad was a Klansman. That's when he told us. And that that kid um, did well with us, graduated school, got a job, got a car, was working and doing great. And then one day, a couple years later, we got a message, a call from his mother called Aaron that, he was in a car accident and he died. And so we were so broken. And we went to his funeral and we met his dad. So Aaron can tell you about his dad. And we were the only Afro-American people at, at his funeral. funeral. And uh, Richard had told me before that, you know, I can't take you over my house because under the foster care system, we take the kids to visit their parents. Or yeah, we're other, in, yeah. You know, to keep them, uh, you know, connected. connected with their family. And uh, he, he used to tell me, I can't take you over to my dad's house because he wouldn't let you on the porch. So we're at the funeral. We sit with uh, Richard's mom. And uh, I was up, up at the casket looking at Richard, doing? at the viewing, looking at Richard. And his this person came up to me and said, are you Ace? They call me Ace. Or are you Aaron? I said, yes, I am. He said, I'm Richard's dad. And I want to tell you, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I want to tell you that Richard really respected you. And I'm thankful that you took your, made a man out of my son. You know, and it, it just, it, it was, and he hugged me. It was know? hard, but it was hard. Well, he, he, learned, he learned the hard way. And what he taught his son, he was he was apologizing, even though his son couldn't hear it. He was apologizing. He wasn't how he take care of his son. But yeah, we we run into things. And then when I went back to the seat, oh, we were the, chair, the, the chair where we were sitting, and his uh, his ex wife said, "I would never believe that my ex would hug a black man." <laughs> and I said, "Well, yeah, yeah. you know, things change." Yeah. Things change. So we've yeah. had those experiences. Well, look, Pat, as you say, through his son, they saw how well he was doing, like you taught him good values. And good values yeah. is, a, is a key to life, isn't it? I mean, absolutely. absolutely. I think it costs nothing to be polite. It costs nothing to say, if you said something wrong, you just say, oh, look, I'm very sorry. I didn't mean that. I, I, I said it out of turn. Hope I, yeah, apologize straight away. You know, sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes it, you may say something not intentionally to upset someone. But you don't mean it. Yeah. It, it, right. can, be, you know, it can be a slip of tongue, isn't it? Yeah. 
But I've done it in the past, you know. I don't know anybody that doesn't. But I learned my lesson not to do it again, you know. Yeah. And I, I, mean, I fully admit it to people. Learn and repeat. Well, you know, we were raised. We were raised as old school. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And it's funny when you go into a store, and I don't care if the cashier could be twenty years old or fifteen years old, and I'll say yes, ma'am, to them. And they look at me and say, "I said." <laughs> you know what? It's just respect. It's just respect. Yeah. It's you know, respect. it's just a word. You can you 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 break the tension. You know, and it's just respect. Yes, ma'am. They're doing me a service. You know, and I think we've lost that. You yeah, know, in, in this day and time, because the kids don't respect anything. They don't respect the elders. Oh, they, re they 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 respect their mobiles. Oh yeah, they respect like them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> it's because we the trouble is we. I think also you've been through lockdowns yourself in the States and you know now I call it the pre-COVID world and the COVID world because yes. there is a definite difference now, definite difference oh, yeah. between society. There's the, the people that are willing to go by the rules and try to do something and, you know, about climate change and do their little bit, blah, blah, blah. And it's always the ones that rebel completely, but it's the ones that people listen to the most. They're the ones yeah. that, you know, like in the football game, like that you have a really good football match and then there's violence at the end of it. You're only going to remember the violence yeah. at the end of it. You're not going to remember the good bits, you know, like, you know, you know. Oh, oh, and also it's the cultural thing as well, because obviously over here, we always hear about gun crime. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm sure it's prevalent over there. You don't guns and all that all the time because you know what, obviously, as you said before, what could happen. Yeah. But, um, but we just don't understand it. We don't understand why anybody would want to carry a gun in the first place. Yeah, but it's right. part of the culture, unfortunately, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I don't live in America, but I presume it's a very cultural kind of thing. Absolutely. What you don't understand is why are they picking on the children, the kindergartners? You know why? Can't defend themselves. Yeah, that's that's the heartbreaking thing about this gun culture in America. You know, they, it's horrible. What 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 did you think of the Black Lives Matters um, campaign? I do you, think do you think, I think the black. The Black Lives Matter was a good thing that they came up with. And like I look at people and somebody say, well, white lives matter, all lives matter. Yes, all lives do matter. But right now, black lives matter because they have never mattered the same way. Mm. That's that's the part that people understand. All lives do matter, all of them. But that black lives matter aspect of it means that they never mattered totally. In the United States, the justice system—the justice system has not been fair to them. No. Not too many any systems have been fair to blacks in our country. So well, that's what obviously, over not here, that they are better or that they should have more. Over here in the UK, we had the problem of the Commonwealth because we used, obviously, you know, we used to have a big empire and we ruled a lot of countries, and we're right. getting a lot of backlash of. Um, Oh, you once ruled us. Um, you can't uh, colonialism, um, anti-colonialism. That you did this, did that, right. and I think to myself, yes, I, I totally agree that they did a lot of wrong. I'm not saying they didn't, but right. you can't just block out the past because it's uncomfortable. Yeah, if you know what I'm okay. saying, you you know, of all the people, the the African Americans know more than anyone apart from the Indian Americans. Got the worst. Yes. How how bad people were treated. Different standards. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But, but you you can't go back. You've always got to you move forward. Can't go back. That's what I tell everybody right day one. You can't go back and change what already happened. We just have to try moving forward doing better and not repeat ourselves. They say history repeats itself and so many times it does. But we have to start repeating it and make it right. I don't know what's going to make that happen, but I'm ready for it. Well, I think you know. you've both got the right attitude in your life about 
getting on with things. I mean, you were both a young kind of in your early teenage years back coming back again. <laughs> Uh, and do you do you uh, uh, do what me and my wife do? Do you sort of every day you got a problem, you sort of talk it out between you, even though you might not quotely agree with it. You sort of say, "Oh yeah, yeah." You talk about it, and then you sort of think, "Oh, we'll do this today." Yeah, that's the end of it. Yeah, we we have we have our share of disagreements. I mean, Mary being around each other for fifty years, we have some disagreements. But sometimes I'll just like act like I'm not hearing him. And let, yeah. us, and, let, and let us think in later or something yeah. like that. And then he says, when I'm mad at him, he said, yeah, he, he, uh, uh, okay. he said, he just don't say nothing back so I can just be quiet. So I don't know. That's my secret share. of being That's your married. secret of being married? Agree, agree with it. Yes, you're right, dear. <laughs> I think it's every man's, every man's marriage. <laughs> yes, dear. Yeah, you know, no, dear. No, it is, dear. Because you don't want to go to bed mad. No, never that. No, I tell young people that when I do speeches, when I go places, whatever you do in that relationship, don't go to bed angry because if you don't fix it before you go to bed, it's going to be there in the morning and it's going to get worse. So don't hold those grudges. Grudges just to tire uh, you out. Please mention your ground. books where we can find them. My book is on Amazon.com and also I have a website and um, the name. The name. My website is my full name in small print. So it's www.sandra, S-A-N-D-R-A-L-K-E-A-R-S-E, Stockton, last name, dot com. Sandra Alcure Stockton dot com. I have a website. You can buy it directly from me and I'll autograph books and mail them. Or you can go to Amazon.com and get my book. Uh, my book is 40 Couture Street. You know that. So I have volume one and volume two. I'm working on book three. And right now, he has our book for, I don't know if you can see it, for Always Room for One More. If they go for that children's book, they have to make sure they use my name. Because there are many books with that name. There's Always Room for One More. What we say about our book, and we have our picture on the back too. What we say about this book is that it's like a little tool. It's very thin, under $20 US. And it's like something like a little dictionary. Like something you can carry around when you get a false child. You're thinking about a false child. You're thinking about adopting. You're thinking about guardianship. My book will give you all the words you need to be familiar with. So if you go to get a child, explore that option, then you can kind of know what it's about. Because when you go to get a child, our agencies are so backed up with children and trying to place them. All they want to do is place that child in a nice home. And I'm going to tell you, I have a little caveat that you need to know. So you need to be able to have a little bit of knowledge base of your own. So our book is and the country you live in, if you can read English, you can understand the book. Because every country has a problem with children, foster children. We did some research on that and seen some of the children problems in other countries. So it's not just going on here where they can't place children. Our, our states in the United States worked on trying to get rid of group homes because many bad things were happening in group homes to children. But now they started waving away from it. Now they're going back to it. But now we're short of parents again. I think that somehow we need to increase that population. Uh, of parents who are willing to accept children into their homes. And I think that they will because the majority of our population is over 50. You know, majority are senior citizens in this country who probably have empty houses. I mean, and they can they do a, do some good for some child who has nothing and maybe just keep a child for a weekend because a lot of parents in the foster care programs have children and they need a break. And you can sign up with an organization so they can be arrested, foster parent, which just means that You'll give somebody a break. I'll take that kid for a day because you got an appointment. I'll take that kid for the weekend so you can get a break. Little things like that. Oh, well. And I'll tell you, if you're getting that in for the money, don't even become a foster care. No, it's not about the money. It, it, you know, you, you, can you raise your kid on $600, 700 800 a month? Not possible. Not possible. So if you want to do it for the money, don't get it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Some people think that. And I have that in the book. You know, it's not about the money. It's about what do you want to do for this person? How do you want to help them so they can grow up and be a good adult, you know, doing well in this world? So it's about what do you want to do? What are you willing to give? So you have to have a good heart. You know, you have to be transparent. And you have to be willing to expect some changes because changes happen. And things pop up unexpectedly when you have children. You just work it out. And make them a member of your family. Yeah. When you bring in a foster child, 
they are a member of your family. Yeah, treat them like they belong. Like your kid. Okay, they might steal something. You don't turn them in. You don't turn your own kid in, kid in if they steal something. You 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 work through it. But under the foster care, they still, I mean, you got to write it down. You got to report them. You know, so you, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. They're, you know, kids make mistakes. And then we were therapeutic foster parents, so we had a different outlook of things. Yeah. You know, we had uh, kids with uh, medical problems, drug, addiction. drug addictions, stealing, stealing, and then we runaways, moved, runaways, <laughs> bed wetters. We've had them all, and then we went on to there are different uh, classes of uh, foster care. We went into independent living. You talk about your 18, 19, 20 year old getting them ready to transition to out to the world. To the world. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of... There's uh, many levels, levels of levels. Yeah. Well, I think you two have done a wonderful job in your life. And Thank I, you. I really re hope you do more. Uh, I really enjoyed our talk. I'm just I'm conscious of the time because you always only get 40 minutes in the free bit. And I like yeah. your picture. Like Maybe your one picture. day we'll come to visit your country. We'll come to visit you. I like your picture on your book with the shoes. I think Thank it's you. like you, you always put, I think what you, your motto should be is that you're always putting on a new pair of shoes every time you get <laughs> <to someone. laughs> Well, thank you, Aaron, and thank you, S S Sandra. I, I, I really thank enjoyed it. I hope you didn't mind me talking about your first book first. Oh, no, no, no. we loved it. He's used to me. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just thought I, I, I thought I thought it'd just be nice contrast between the two. You know, yeah. One being, you know, as I said before, the dark, but the other one is the light, and that's what life is. We all have the dark yeah. bits, and we all have the light bits. Yeah, and yeah. that's what we need, isn't it? That's what we need a lot of. We need more love. We need more forgiveness. That's what we need. And I, I, I thank you again. I shall mention your website and I shall put the link to the book on my um, YouTube link when I do it in a minute. Thank you. And I'll take what I do, it's an audio version, but I'll take a picture of the book cover okay. and I'll use that for you, okay? Okay. I appreciate thank you. Appreciate and um, I do appreciate you giving your time of day. I know time of day is very valuable um, in thank life. Thank you very much. And try to keep cool <laughs> we will <laughs> all right bye-bye right, thank you very much bye thank you bye